Hello. Today is the 30th of January 2024. In my last video uh, yesterday, I think it was, uh, talking about um, creating consent, manufacturing consent, manipulation, um, I read you a little story about Oedipus, um, from where the Oedipus complex is derive mother and father and, and so on and I was reading from a book and a very interesting little book and I thought well, what else is here so I found lots of stories from um, mythological stories and I found one on Hercules and I hope you're interested because, <laughs> because I'm going to read you the story of Hercules now, why am I interested in Hercules specifically? Well, I'm not, but I'll tell you at the end of the video why I chose this story out of so many. And so let me tell you the story of Hercules. The greatest hero of Greece was Hercules. He was a personage of quite another order from the great hero of Athens, Theseus. He was what all Greece except Athens at most admired. The Athenians were different from the other Greeks and their hero therefore was different. Theseus was of course bravest of the brave as all heroes are, but unlike other heroes he was as compassionate as he was brave and a man of great intellect as well as great bodily strength. It was natural that the Athenians should have such a hero because they valued thought and ideas as no other part of the country did. In Theseus their ideal was embodied. But Hercules embodied what the rest of Greece most valued. His qualities were those the Greeks in general honoured and admired. Except for unflinching courage, they were not those that distinguished Theseus. Hercules was the strongest man, man on earth, and he had the supreme self-confidence magnificent physical strength gives. He considered himself on an equality with the gods, and with some reason. They needed his help to conquer the giants. In the final victory of the Olympians over the brutish sons of earth, Hercules' arrows played an important part. He treated the gods accordingly. Once, when the priestess at Delphi gave no response to the question he asked, he seized the tripod she sat on and declared that he would carry it off and have an oracle of his own. Apollo, of course, would not put up with this, but Hercules was perfectly willing to fight him, and Zeus had to intervene. Zeus, Jupiter, the god of gods. The quarrel was easily settled, however. Hercules was quite good-natured about it. He did not want to quarrel with Apollo, he only wanted an answer for his, from his oracle. If Apollo would give it, the matter was settled as far as he was concerned. Apollo, on his side, facing this undaunted pers person, felt an admiration for his boldness and made his priestess deliver the response. Throughout his life, Hercules had this perfect confidence that no matter who was against him, he could never be defeated, and the facts bore him out. Whenever he fought with anyone, the issue was certain beforehand. He could overcome only by a supernatural force. Hera, Jupiter, uh, Zeus' wife, used hers against him with terrible effect, and in the end he was killed by magic. But nothing that lived in the air, sea, or on land ever defeated him. Intelligence did not figure largely in anything he did, and was op often conspicuously absent. <laughs> Once, when he was too hot, he pointed an arrow at the sun and threatened to shoot him. 
Another time, when the boat he was in was tossed about by the waves, he told the waters that he would punish them if they did not grow calm. His intellect was not strong. His emotions were. Look, at, look always at what they are teaching us and telling us. Don't just concentrate on the tale, but what each thing um, means. Okay, so um, his emotions were stronger than his intellect. They were quickly aroused and apt to get out of control as when he deserted the Argo and forgot all about his comrades and the quest of the golden fleece in his despairing grief at losing his young Armavera Hylas. This power of deep feeling in a man of his tremendous strength was oddly endearing, but it, was, it worked in men's harm too. He had sudden outbursts burst of furious anger which were always fatal to the often innocent objects. When the rage had passed and he had come to himself, he would show a most disarming penitence and agree humbly to any punishment he was proposed to inflict on him. Without his consent, he could not have been punished by anyone, yet nobody ever endured so many punishments. He spent a large part of his life expiating one unfortunate deed after another, and never rebelling against the almost impossible demands made upon him. Sometimes he punished himself when others were inclined to exonerate him. It would have been ludicrous to put him in command of a kingdom, as Theseus was put. He had more than enough to do to command himself. He could never have thought out any new or great idea as the Athenian hero was held to have done. His thinking was limited to devising a way to kill a monster which was threatening to kill him. Nevertheless, he had true greatness, not because he had complete courage based upon overwhelming strength, which is merely a matter of course, but because by his sorrow for wrongdoing and his willingness to do anything to expiate it, he showed greatness of soul. If only he had done some greatness of mind as well, at least enough to lead him along the ways of reason, he would have been the perfect hero. He was born in Tevis and for a long time was held to be the son of Amphitryon, a distinguished general. In those earlier years he was called Alcides, or descendant of Alceus, who was Amphitryon's father, but in reality he was the son of Zeus, who had visited Amphitryon's wife, Alcmena, in the shape of her husband when the general was away fighting. She bore two children, Hercules to Zeus and Iphicles to Amphitryon. The difference in the boy's descent was clearly shown in the way each acted in the face of a great danger which came to them before they were one year old. Hera, as always, was furiously jealous and she determined to kill Hercules. One evening, Alcmena gave both the children their baths and their fill of milk and laid them in their crib caressing them and saying, Sleep, my little ones, soul of my soul, happy be your slumber and happy your awakening. She rocked the cradle and in a moment the babies were asleep. But at darkest midnight, when all was silent in the house, two great snakes came crawling into the nursery there was light in the room, and as the two reared up above the crib, with weaving heads and flickering tongues, the children woke. Iphicles screamed and tried to get out of bed, but Hercules sat up and grasped the deadly creatures by the throat. 
They turned and twisted and wound their coils around his body, but he held them fast. The mother heard Iphicles screams and, calling to her husband, rushed to the nursery. There sat Hercules laughing, in each hand a long, limp body. He gave them gleefully to Amphitryon. They were dead. All knew then that the child was destined to great things. Tiresias, the blind prophet of Tevis, told Alcmena, I swear that many a Greek woman, as she cards the wool at eventide, shall sing of this your son and you who bore him. He shall be the hero of all mankind. Great care was taken with his education, but teaching him what he did not wish to learn was a dangerous business. He seems not to have liked music, which was a most important part of a Greek boy's training, or else he disliked his music master. He flew into a rage with him <laughs> and kicked him with his lute. <laughs> This was the first time he dealt a fatal blow without intending it. He did not mean to kill the poor musician. <laughs> he just struck out on the impulse of the moment without thinking, hardly aware of his strength. He was sorry, very, very sorry, but that did not keep him, keep him from doing the same thing again and again. The other subject he was taught fencing, wrestling, and driving, he took to more kindly, and his teachers in these branches all survive. By the time he was eighteen, he was full grown, and he killed alone by himself a great lion, which lived in the woods of Citherion, the Thespian lion. Ever after, he wore its skin as a cloak, with the head forming a kind of hood over his own head. His next exploit was to fight and conquer the Minions, who had been exacting a burdensome tribute from the Thebans. The grateful citizens gave him as a reward the hand of the Princess Megara. He was devoted to her and to their children, and yet this marriage brought upon him the greatest sorrow of his life as well as trials and dangers such as no one ever went through, before or after. When Megara had borne him three sons, three sons, he went mad. Hera, who never forgot a wrong, sent the madness upon him. He killed his children, and Megara too, as she tried to protect the youngest. Then his sanity returned, he found himself in his blood-stained hall, the dead bodies of his sons and his wife beside him. He had no idea what had happened, how they had been killed. Only a moment since, as it seemed to him, they have all been talking together. As he stood there in utter bewilderment, the terrified people who were watching him from a distance saw that the mad fit was over and Amphitryon dared to approach him. There was no keeping the truth from Hercules. He had to know how this horror had come to pass, and Amphitryon told him. Hercules heard him out, then he said, and I myself am the murderer of my dearest. Yes, Amphitryon answered trembling, but you were out of your mind. Hercules paid no attention to the implied excuse. Shall I spare my own life then, he said, I will avenge upon myself these deaths. But before he could rush out and kill himself, even as he started to do so, his desperate purpose was changed and his life was spared. 
This miracle, it was nothing less, of recalling Hercules from frenzied feeling and violent action to sober reason and sorrowful acceptance, was not wrought by a god descending from the sky. It was a miracle caused by human friendship. His friend Theseus stood behind before him and stretched out his hands to clasp those blind blood-stained hands. Thus, according to the common Greek idea, he would himself become defiled and have a part in Hercules' guilt. Do not start back, he told Hercules. Do not keep me from sharing all with you. Evil I share with you is not evil to me. I and hear me, men great of soul can bear the blows of heaven and not flinch. Hercules said, Do you know what I have done? I know this, Theseus answered, your sorrows reached from earth to heaven. So I will die, said Hercules. No hero spoke those words, Theseus said. What can I do but die? Hercules cried. Live? A branded man, for all to say, look, there is he who killed his wife and sons. Everywhere my jailers, the sharp scorpions of the tongue. Even so, suffer and be strong, Theseus answered. You shall come to Athens with me, share my home and all things with me and you will give to me and to the city a great return the glory of having helped you a long silence followed at last hercules spoke slow heavy words so let it be he said i will be strong and wait for death the two went to Athens, but Hercules did not stay there long. Theseus, the thinker, rejected the idea that a man could be guilty of murder when he had not known what he was doing, and that those who helped such a one could be reckoned defiled. The Athenians agreed and welcomed the poor hero. But he himself could not understand such ideas. He could not think the thing out at all. He could only feel. He had killed his family. Therefore he was defiled and a defiler of others. He deserved that all should turn from him with loathing. At Delphi, where he went to consult the oracle, the priestess looked at the matter just as he did. He needed to be purified, she told him, and only a terrible penance could do that. She bade him go to his cousin, Eurystheus, king of Mycenae, of Tyrians in some stories, and submit to whatever he demanded of him. He went willingly, ready to do anything that could make him clean again. It is plain from the rest of the story that the priestess knew that Eurystheus, what uh, that the priestess knew what Eurystheus was like, and that he would, beyond question, purge Hercules thoroughly. Eurystheus was by no by no means stupid but of a very ingenious turn of mind. And when the strongest man on earth came to him humbly, prepared to be his slave, he devised a series of penances, which from the point of view of difficulty and danger could not have been improved upon. It must be said, however, that he was helped and urged on by Hera. To the end of Hercules' life, she never forgave him for being Zeus' son. The tasks Eurystheus gave him to do are called the labors of Hercules. There were twelve of them, and each one was all but impossible. The first was to kill the lion of Nemea, a beast no weapons could wound. 
that difficulty Hercules solved by choking the life out of him. Then he heaved a huge carcass up on his back and carried it into Mycenae. After that, Eurystheus, a cautious man, would not let him inside the city. He gave him his orders from afar. The second labor was to go to Lerna and kill a creature with nine heads called the Hydra, which lived in a swamp there. This was exceedingly hard to do because one of the heads was immortal and the others almost as bad inasmuch as when Hercules chopped off one, two grew up instead. However, he was helped by his nephew Aeolus, who brought him a burning brand, brand with which he seared the neck as he cut each head off so that it could not sprout again. When all had been chopped off, he disposed of the one that was immortal by burying it securely under a great rock. The third labor was to bring back alive a stag with horns of gold, sacred to Artemis, which lived in the forest of Serenicia. He could have killed it easily, but to take it alive was another matter, and he hunted it for a whole year before he succeeded. The fourth labor was to capture a great boar which had its lair on Mount Erymanthus. He chased the beast from one place to another until it was exhausted. Then he drove it into a deep snow and trapped it. The fifth labor was to clean the Ogean stables in a single day. Ogeas had thousands of cattle and their stalls had not been cleared out for years. Hercules diverted the courses of two rivers and made them flow through the stables in a great flood that washed out the filth in no time at all. The sixth labor was to drive away the Stymphalian birds, which were a plague to the people of Stamphalus because of their enormous numbers. He was helped by Athena to drive them out of their coverts, and as they flew up, he shot them. The seventh labor was to go to Crete and fetch from there the beautiful savage bull that Poseidon had given Minos. Hercules mastered him, put him in a, boat, in a boat and brought him to Eurystheus. The eighth labor was to get the man-eating mares of King Diomedes of Trace. Hercules slew Diomedes first and then drove off the mares unopposed. The ninth labor was to bring back the girdle of Hippolyta, the queen of the Amazons. When Hercules arrived, she met him kindly and told him she would give him the girdle, but Hera stirred up trouble again. She made the Amazons think that Her Hercules was going to carry off their queen, and they charged down on his ship. Hercules, without the thought of how kind Hippolyta had been, without any thought at all, instantly killed her taking it for granted that she was responsible for the attack. He was able to fight off the others and get away with the girdle. The tenth labor was to bring back the cattle of Gerion, who was a monster with three bodies living on Erythia, a western island. On his way there, Hercules reached the land at the end of the Mediterranean, and he set up as a memorial of his journey two great rocks called the Pillars of Hercules, now Gibraltar and Theuta. Then he got the oxen and took them to Mycenae. The eleventh labor was the most difficult of all so far. It was to bring back the golden apples of the Hesperides, and he did not know where they were to be found. Atlas, who bore the vault of heaven upon his shoulders, was the father of the Hesperides, so Hercules went to him and asked him to get the apples for him. He offered to take upon himself the burden of the sky while Atlas was away. 
Atlas, seeing a chance of being relieved forever from his heavy task, gladly agreed. He came back with the apples, but he did not give them to Hercules. He told Hercules he could keep on holding up the sky, for Atlas himself would take the apples to Eristheus. On this occasion, Hercules had only his wits to trust to. He had to give all his strength to support in that mighty load. He was successful, but because of Atlas' stupidity rather than his own cleverness. He agreed to Atlas' plan, but asked him to take the sky back for just a moment so that Hercules could put a pad on his shoulders to ease the pressure. Atlas did so, and Hercules picked up the apples and went off. The twelfth labor was the worst of all. It took him down to the lower world. And it was there, and it was then that he freed Theseus from the chair of forgetfulness. His task was to bring Cerverus, the three-headed dog, up from Hades, from hell. Pluto gave him permission, provided Hercules used no weapons to overcome him. He could use his hands only. Even so, he forced the terrible monster to submit to him. He lifted him and carried him all the way up to the earth and on to the Mycenae. Aristheus very sensibly did not want to keep him and made Hercules carry him back. This was his last labor. When all were completed, and full expiation made for the death of his wife and children, he would seem to have earned ease and tranquility for the rest of his life. But it was not so. He was never tranquil and at ease. An exploit quite as difficult as most of the labors was the conquest of Anteus, a giant and a mightly re mighty wrestler who forced strangers to wrestle with him on condition that if he was victor, he should kill them. He was roofing a temple with the skulls of his victims. As long as he could touch the earth, he was invincible. If thrown to the ground, he sprang up with renewed strength from the contact. Hercules lifted him up and, holding him in the air, strangled him. And this is, you see the picture? That's <laughs> Atlas carrying Cerverus. Story after story is told of his adventures. He fought the river god, Achilles, because Achilles was in love with the girl Hercules now wanted to marry. Like everyone else by this time, Achilles had no desire to fight him, and he tried to reason with him. But n that never worked with Hercules. If it only made him more angry, he said, my hand is better than my tongue. Let me wing fighting, and you may wing talking. Achilles took the form of a bull and attacked him fiercely, but Hercules was used to subduing bulls. He conquered him and broke off one of his horns. The cause of the contest, a young princess named Deanira, became his wife. He traveled to many lands and did many other great deeds. At Troy he rescued a maiden who was in the same plight as Andromeda, waiting on the shore to be devoured by, sea, by a sea monster which could be appeased in no other way. She was the daughter of King Lamedon, who had cheated Apollo and Poseidon of the, uh, ch had cheated <coughs> who had cheated Apollo and Poseidon of their wages after, at Zeus' command, they had built for the king the, the walls of Troy. In return, Apollo sent a pestilence and Poseidon the sea serpent. Hercules agreed to rescue the girl if her father would give him the horses Zeus had given his grandfather. 
Lao Midon promise, but when Hercules had slain the monster, the king refused to pay, and Hercules captured the city, killed the king, and gave the maiden to his friend, Telamon of Salamis, who had helped him. On his way to Atlas to ask him about the golden apples, Hercules came to the Caucasus, where he freed Prometheus, slaying the eagle that preyed on him. Along with these glorious deeds, there were others not glorious. He killed with a careless thrust of his arm a lad who was serving him by pouring water on his hands before a feast. It was an accident, and the boy's father forgave Hercules, but Hercules could not forgive himself, and he went into exile for a time. Far worse was his deliberately slaying a good friend in order to avenge an insult offered him by the young man's father, King Eurytus. For this base action, Zeus himself punished him. He sent him to Lydia to be a slave to the queen, on Fale, some say for a year, some th for three years. She amused herself with him, making him at times dressed up as a woman and do woman's work, weave or spin. He submitted patiently, as always, but he felt himself degraded by this servitude, and with complete unreason blamed Eurytus for it and swore he would punish him to the utmost when he was freed. All the stories told about him are characteristic, but the one which gives the clearest picture of him is the account of a visit he made when he was on his, on his way to get the man-eating mares of Diomedes, one of the twelve labors. The house he had planned to spend the night in, that of his friend Admetus, a king in Thessaly, was a place of deep mourning when he came to it, although he did not know. Admetus had just lost his wife in a very strange way. The, co the cause of her death went back into the past, to the time when Apollo, in anger at Zeus for killing his son, Euscolapius, kill Zeus' workmen, the Cyclopes. He was punished by being forced to serve on earth as a slave for a year, and Admetus was the master he chose or Zeus chose for him. During his servitude, Apollo made friends with the household, especially with the head of it and his wife Alcestis. When he had an opportunity to prove how strong his friendship was, he took it. He learned that the three fates had spun all of Admetus' thread of life and were on the point of cutting it. He obtained from them a respite. If someone would die in Admetus' stead, he could live. This news he took to Admetus, who at once set about finding a substitute for himself. He went first, quite confidently, to his father and mother. They were old, and they were devoted to him. Certainly one or the other would consent to take his place in the world of the dead. But to his astonishment, he found they would not. They told him, God's daylight is sweet, even to the old. We do not ask you to die for us, we will not die for you. And they were completely unmoved by his angry contempt. You, stand palsied at the gate of death and yet afraid to die. He would not give up, however. He went to his friends, begging one after another of them to die and let him live. He evidently thought his life was so valuable that someone would surely save it, even at the cost of the supreme sacrifice. But he met with an invariable refusal. At last, in despair, he went back to his house, and there he found the substitute. His own wife, Alcestis, offered to die for him.
no one who has read so far will need to be told that he accepted the offer. He felt exceedingly sorry for her and still more for himself in having to lose so good a wife and he stood weeping beside her as she died. When she was gone, he was overwhelmed with grief and decreed that she should have the most magnificent of, funer of funerals. It was at this point that Hercules arrived to rest and enjoy himself under a friend's roof on his journey north to Diomedes. The way Admetus treated him shows more plainly than any other story we have how high the standards of hospitality were, how much was expected from a host to a guest. As soon as Admetus was told of Hercules' arrival, he came to meet him with no appearance of mourning except in his dress. His manner was that of one gladly welcoming a friend. To Hercules' question who was dead, he answered quietly that a woman of his household, but no relative of his, was to be buried that day. Hercules instantly declared that he would not trouble him with his presence at such a time, but Admetus steadily refused to let him go elsewhere. I will not have you sleep under another's roof, he told him. To his servants he said that the guest was to be taken to a distant room where he could hear no sounds of grief and given dinner and lodging there. No one must let him know what had happened. Hercules dined alone, but he understood that Admetus must, as a matter of form, attend the funeral, and the fact did not stand in the way of his enjoying himself. The servants left at home to attend to him were kept busy, satisfying his enormous appetite and still more refilling his wine jug. Hercules became very happy and very drunk and very noisy. He roared out songs at the top of his voice, some of them highly objectionable songs, and behaved himself in a way that was nothing less than indecent at the time of a funeral. When the servants looked their disapproval, he shouted at them not to be so solemn. Couldn't they give him a smile now? And then, now and then, like, a good, like good fellows, their gloomy faces took away his appetite. Have a drink with me, he cried, many drinks. One of them answered timidly that it was not a time for laughter and drinking. Why not, thundered Hercules, because a stranger woman is dead? A stranger, faltered the servant. Well, that's what Admetus told me, Hercules said angrily. I suppose you won't say he lied to me? Oh, no, no, the servant answered. Only he is too hospitable. But please have some more wine. Our travel is only our own. He turned to fill the wine cup, but Her Hercules seized him, and no one, no one ever disregarded that grasp. There is something strange here, he said to the frightened man. What is wrong? You see for yourself we are in mourning, the other answered. But why, man, why? Hercules cried. Has my host made a fool of me? Who is dead? Alcestis, the servant whispered, our queen. There was a long silence. Then Hercules threw down his cup. I might have known, he said. I saw he had been weeping. His eyes were red, but he swore he was stranger. He made me come in, oh, good friend and good host. And I, got drunk, made merry in this house of sorrow. Oh, he should have told me. Then he did, as always, he heaped blame upon himself. He had been a fool, a drunken fool, when the man he cared for was crushed with grief. 
grief. As always, too, his thoughts turned quickly to find some way of atoning. What could he do to make amends? There was nothing he could not do. He was perfectly sure of that, but what was there which would help his friend? Then light dawned on him. Of course, he said to himself, that is the way. I must bring Alcestis back from the dead. Of course, nothing could be clearer. I'll find that old fellow, death. He's sure to be near her tomb, and I'll wrestle with him. I will crack his body between my arms until he gives her back to me. If he is not by the grave, I will go down to Hades after him. Oh, I will return good. I will return good to my friend who has been so good to me. Let me have a glass of water. And he hurried out exceedingly pleased with himself and enjoying the prospect of what promised to be a very good wrestling match. When Admetus returned to his empty and desolate house, Hercules was there to greet him, and by his side was a woman. Look at her, Admetus, he said. Is she like any one you know? And when Admetus cried out, A ghost! Is it a trick? Some mockery of the gods? Hercules answered, It is your wife. I fought death for her, and I made him give her back to me. There is no other story about Hercules which shows so clearly his character as the Greeks saw it. His simplicity and blundering stupidity, his inability to get roaring drunk in a house where someone was dead, his quick penitence and desire to make amends at no matter what cost, his perfect confidence that not even death was his match. That is the portrait of Hercules. To be sure, it would have been still more accurate if he had if it had shown him in a fit of rage killing one of the servants who were annoying him with their gloomy faces, but the poet Euripides, from whom we get the story, kept it clear of everything that did not bear directly on Alcestis' death and return to life. Another death or two, however natural, when Hercules was present, would have blurred the picture he wanted to paint. As Hercules had sworn to do while he was uh, Omphale's slave, no sooner was he freed that he started to punish King Eurytus because he himself had been punished by Zeus for killing Eurytus' son. He collected an army captured the king's city and put him to death. But Eurytus too was avenged, for indirectly this victory was the cause of Hercules' own death. Before he had quite completed the destruction of the city, he sent home where Deniara, sorry, Deianira, his devoted wife, was waiting for him to come back from Ophale in Lydia, a band of captive maidens, one of them especially beautiful, Aeoli, the king's daughter. The man who brought them to Deianira told her that Hercules was madly in love with this princess. This news was not so hard for Deianira as might be expected, because she believed she had a powerful love charm which she had kept for years and years against just such an evil a woman in her own house preferred before her. Directly after her marriage, when Hercules was taking her home, they had reached the river where the centaur Nessus acted as a ferryman carrying travellers over the water. He took Dianira on his back and in midstream insulted her. She shrieked and Hercules shot the beast as he reached the other bank. Before he died, he told Dianira to take some of his blood and use it as a charm for Hercules if ever he loved another woman more than her. 
When she heard about Aioli now, it seemed to her the time had come, and she anointed the splendid robe with the blood and sent it to Hercules by the messenger. As the hero put it on, the effect was the same as that of the robe Medea had sent her rival, whom Jason was about to marry. A fearful pain seized him, as though he were in a burning fire. In his first agony, he turned on Dionysus' messenger, who was, of course, completely innocent, seized him and hurled him down into the sea. He could still slay others, but it seemed that he himself could not die. The anguish he felt hardly weakened him. What had instantly killed the young princess of Corinth could not kill Hercules. He was in torture, but he lived and they brought him home. Long before, Dianida had heard what her gift had done to him and had killed herself. In the end, he did the same. Since death would not come to him, he would go to death himself. He ordered those around him to build a great pyre on Mount Oita and carry him to it. When at last he reached it, he knew that now he could die, and he was glad. This is rest, he said. This is the end. And as they lifted him to the pyre, he lay down on, on it as one who at a banquet table lies down upon his couch. He asked his useful, youthful follower, Philotetes, to hold the torch to set the wood on fire, and he gave him his bow and arrows, which were to be far famed in the young man's hands too at Troy. Then the flames rushed up, and Hercules was seen no more on earth. He was taken to heaven, where he was reconciled to Hera, and married her daughter and married her daughter, heavy, and where, says the poem, after his mighty labours he has rest, his choices prize the eternal peace within the homes of blessedness. But it is not easy to imagine him contently enjoying rest and peace, or allowing the blessed gods to do so either. <laughs> That's a lovely story. I just wanted to show you something here. Um, whoops. Uh, let's see. Okay, if you can see, not very well because of the light, but this is the Tower of Hercules. It's a lighthouse. Um, let me see if I get some more there and let me see if I can get a better picture here <laughs> 